Hello everyone and welcome to the first session of The World War Not, How Gilles Châtelet Thinks About the Formal, taught by Ben Woodard. The philosopher Gilles Châtelet is an unfairly unknown thinker and activist. A contemporary of Gilles Deleuze, Châtelet synthesized extensive research in physics, philosophy, politics, and economics in order to develop a philosophy emphasizing formalization as something emerging from the natural while at the same time extending the wild creativity of mind found in the tail end of French rationalism. In a similar fashion, Châtelet extracted the theory of the formal from German Romanticism and idealism, especially Schelling, by emphasizing an epistemic movement from intuition to the gesture, to the diagram, and finally to the sign. Following the Romantic tradition, Châtelet saw the action of thought as processes of nature reflected back to itself in this broad understanding of the formal, where the diagram is the capture of the gesture before it is frozen in a letter or number. This seminar will introduce Châtelet's work with a particular emphasis on the gesture, the diagram, and how they bring him close to, but keeps him apart from, the works and thoughts of Deleuze Cavallès and Merleau-Ponty. This seminar is taught by Ben Woodard, currently a fellow at the ICI Berlin. He received his PhD in Theory and Criticism from Western University in 2016 and has been a postdoctoral researcher at the IPK at Lufana University. Since 2020, he has lectured at the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy mostly on the history, philosophy, and politics of the life sciences. Ben also writes on science fiction, horror film, and literature. He is the author of numerous articles and three books, Slime Dynamics, Generation, Mutation, and the Creep of Life at Zero, On an Ungrounded Earth Towards a New Geophilosophy at Punctum, and Schelling's Naturalism, Motion, Space, and the Volition of Thought. He is also a translator of French philosophy and in particular the work of Gilles Châtelet. Ben is also a founding member of the philosophy coll collective PS, which is based at the Performing Arts Forum in Saint-Herme, France. Ben, please, the floor is yours. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much for the introduction and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. All right, and um, yeah, it's yeah, glad uh, I'm glad to see that so many people are at least uh, theoretically interested in learning about Châtelet. And it's also a bit of a funny homecoming for me, I realized, because I taught at the New Center back in 2014, which was also the year that To Live and Think Like Pigs was translated by Châtelet, which was read at the New Center in a group reading se section. Um, so there's a kind of interesting... Uh, return to to the beginning in a way. Uh, so uh, we'll kind of talk about the logistics of the course towards the end uh, in terms of the papers and, and do introductions if we have time today. Uh, so before that, I'll just try to get into, um, you know, why Châtelet and, then, and who, who he was, and then to describe one part of his work today or one way of thinking uh, that as it operates in his work. So I'll just share some slides really quickly. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, the, um, as sort of by way of introduction, I think I should say first, you know, why the formal, there's lots of ways and uh, to enter and to sort of talk about Châtelet's work. And the formal seems obvious on the one hand because he was so interested in mathematics, and, but as also physics and philosophy and later economics. And so he sort of seemed to be very much a thinker of the formal, but he was a very peculiar one uh, in how he thought about formalisms or the formal in part because I think when people in philosophy think about uh, philosophers who address the formal, they tend to think about logic, or they tend to think about the structure of language, 
or computation or these types of formalities, I think, tend to be the default. But Chatelet is one who really thought about the formal in terms of space, right? So in terms of geometry, in terms of the gesture and the diagram, as we'll talk about. And very much also, this wasn't so much a formalism, uh, you know, meant to simply describe the history of mathematics or formalism in the sciences, but to talk about how the formal is really embodied uh, in a particular way. Um, but as we'll see, that embodiment is not uh, very straightforward. It has to be constructed in a very peculiar sense. And so that is one of the tasks of the course, is to sort of show what he means by the formal, and what does it mean when the formal is, or formalism, or formal thinking, is kind of reintegrated or seen as never separate from um, you know, things we would take to be quite different from it, nature or natural processes or embodiment or experience or these kinds of things. And so just to get a taste before talking about Châtelet, I think it's uh, important to get a taste of him as a person. And so this is a quote from Badiou and the preface to live and think like pigs. So Badiou writes, Controlled violence, biting sarcasm, discontent with the world and with oneself in the world, the courage to hold fast, solitary, in the face of contemporary abjection, the reader will encounter all of the above in this book and will understand why the rage to live that animated Jules Châtelet was tempered by a terrible melancholy. The melancholy of seeing that we are solicited, and increasingly so, to live and think like pigs. I should like here to inscribe the memory of Guy Châtelet in a broader context and to respond to a question that seems to suggest itself. How is it that a thinker specializing in the history and the theory of the sciences, this mathematician doubling as a philosopher, this subtle intellectual favored with a great talent for writing, could be swept up in such a polemical rage against our current terrestrial life? How could someone who in academic language would be called an epistemologist, a discipline one might assume to be the calmest of all, come to foment with himself a ferocious polemic, a sort of sacred fury? So yes, formalism, but what? Formalism, but not separated from life, not a formalism of a detached rationality but a formalism that is this embodied, moving, animated thing. And how is this possible? So as in part a kind of disclaimer, uh, or uh, maybe a disclaimer, <laughs> sort of um, just to say how my own experience with Châtelet is going to, of course, color or code the way I talk about him, uh, sort of by way of introduction, I would say that I encountered Châtelet in 2007 or 2008, uh, while reading Ian Hamilton's grant, uh, Ian Hamilton Grant's Philosophies of Nature after Schelling, where Châtelet appears here and there as a kind of supporting character. And I sort of became curious with this figure who I had never heard of, you know, this 20th century, um, you know, incredibly wide ranging, interesting. Uh, wild kind of theorist who, on top of everything else, had a deeply nuanced and interesting reading of Schelling, which was um, quite surprising because, you know, having done so much research on Schelling and not encountered him, I thought this was peculiar, but also the kinds of texts that Châtelet, Châtelet knew and read and discussed of Schelling's were very uh, unpopular in France, we should say. They were not the texts that Deleuze referenced. They were not the texts that Xavier Tillet and people uh, interested in theology referenced. Somehow, Châtelet had discovered Schelling on his own and become completely engrossed in his work. And so this is why I sort of became uh, so enamored with Châtelet, and he became a sort of supporting character in my dissertation, which then turned into the book um, which is also to say, you know, my entry to Châtelet is through Schelling. And so that definitely 
um, affects how I read him. Though, of course, uh, you know, the aim of the class is to obviously go beyond that, but just to say that's always sort of there in the background. And then the other sort of context in which, again, I discussed and encountered Shatley, this is a diagram, don't worry about it. Um, this is just for illustration, uh, made by a friend of mine named Matt Hare, who is a philosopher of mathematics, who we met um, at this uh, in this philosophy collective that was mentioned. And we both realized we were sort of wrestling with similar issues in terms of this question of the formal. How can we have the formal uh, in this French tradition that is less known than some others? So people like Lautmann or the late Rue Ponty or Jean Cavaillez, these kinds of figures, Simon Don to an extent, right, who are sort of uh, the sort of last attempts in many ways to kind of do this French or, or continental philosophy of science. And to talk about, you know, what does it mean to say that the formal is um, is embodied? Like, what really does that mean in the end, in terms of the status of knowledge? How abstract is this? And that kind of question led to this article um, that we co-authored to sort of try and address this. And this is why also the formal is part of the structure of the class, because we sort of attempted to think this problem that Châtelet had, and that also Frege, Frege and Schelling and others had in terms of, you know, if everything is pure creation or if there's this kind of generative, constructive nature, then what is it really that formalism does? What is this kind of capture or what is the difference between artificial and natural languages, right? Like what really, how do we come to create formal constructions if we weren't already rational, if we weren't already sort of capturing thoughts in a kind of well-ordered way. And so with this, you know, it, it kind of becomes clear how strange Châtelet is as a thinker because he's very much um, talking about creation and experiment and play with concepts and things that make him sound very similar to Deleuze. Um, and sort of typically of his generation and of his country. Um, but you sort of realize that he is trying to construct or sort of talk about philosophy in a very old fashioned sense in one way, this kind of, you know, philosophy and uh, um, way of thinking about concepts in a very expansive universal sense, very abstract sense. But there's always constructed from very small, very particular moments of thought. So even though he's a kind of radical, kind of um, explosive thinker, he's also very interested in this very careful stepwise construction of what thought does when a scientist has, a, you know, a thought experiment, when a new way of formalizing is discovered, when a new experiment is constructed. And so he's very much against this kind of thinking as a series of of surprise parties, as he kind of puts it at one point. He thinks there's a there's a deep, deep continuity uh, between the sciences, between mathematics, between physics, and that discovering it often involves a kind of sideways or diagonal move. It's very difficult to articulate directly how this happens, but he thinks one of the places it does happen is in the construction of new formalisms. And as I said, less um, a sort of logical question and more one of the diagram or these kind of spatial and geometrical constructions. And then the sort of last um, or sort of my more recent encounter with Châtelet uh, is translating him, right? And you sort of realize again how, how strange and singular he is as a thinker when you try to translate him from French, uh, which is very difficult. Uh, and this book, this enchantment of the virtual, which hopefully will come out this year, uh, I believe it took more than half a dozen people to kind of wrestle it uh, to a place where it was um, coherent and understandable. And it's again, in part because of Châtelet's breadth in terms of knowledge, you know, the physics, the philosophy, 
and the philosophy ranging from the ancient, um, you know, to the contemporary, same with physics, um, but also the fact that he'll pepper his writings with really obscure references to comic books from the 1920s or, um, you know, little in-jokes um, from club culture or whatever it is. And so it takes a sort of massive amount of, of work to sort of translate him for these reasons. But it also gives you a sort of uh, deeper appreciation for sort of how he constructed his arguments. Okay, and then, um, yeah, the sort of last bit of uh, self-promotion in a way, um, these are these three texts, the one I just mentioned, or show the anti-Eureka one, but I've also written several others on Châtelet, trying to um, talk about him in terms of his work with metaphors and diagrams in particular. And it's difficult to even get work published on him or to get work of his out in the world in a way, um, because, um, and I'll talk about why uh, in just a minute, um, but he is still you know, a relatively unknown thinker. And so he is difficult to sort of take up in any way. His writing is difficult, but I think he represents a sort of a lost tradition or a sort of diminished tradition in French thought and thought in general um, that is worth reactivating. I mean, that's the hope. Okay. So, <clears throat> so then I'll sort of talk about sort of intellectual biography in a sense of Châtelet. And this is a, yeah, a photo from one of his favorite haunts in Paris. Okay, so with Châtelet, as I sort of already suggested, he's very often folded under the work of Deleuze, right? So um, Deleuze is, is sort of seen as his master in, in some ways. Châtelet um, sat in his courses, so some of Deleuze's lectures will have Châtelet asking questions or causing trouble, and we'll look at those uh, in the last class a bit. Um, and of course, there's obvious reasons for this. I mean, Châtelet shows a kind of affinity for Deleuze and Guattari's work, um, like in what is philosophy, and um, the work uh, Deleuze's work on the fold, when he you know, touches on mathematics. But there are certain moments in which Châtelet distinguishes himself uh, from Deleuze. And one of the biggest ones, as we'll see, is in part this use of the formal or the, the play of the formal, and that um, Châtelet will defend the sort of autonomy of mathematics or the conceptual autonomy of mathematics from de what Deleuze will say at certain points. So there's a kind of authority to philosophy that um, Deleuze and Châtelet have a very different opinion on, but you know it's it doesn't come out in the printed works. But as we'll see again in the fourth session, it comes out in kind of sideways comments and references in some of the, the later work um, between Guattari, Deleuze, and Châtelet. The other place um, where Châtelet does appear, his name appears in brief discussions of his work. Uh, are getting more and more common, sort of referenced here um, in this second book in the middle. Uh, it's in very much, and Freitas and Sinclair are probably the best known, that Châtelet's work on diagrams in particular and gestures, um, but mostly diagrams, is used as a way of talking about mathematical pedagogy right? and embodied mathematics or embodied pedagogy in different ways. Right. So, and this has become more common also with attempts to uh, talk about right, embodied cognition or like how this relates to pedagogy. So, the kind of use of gestures and diagrams um, is seen, his way of articulating them is seen as a kind of uh, very important way to think about mathematics, not as this thing on the page, right? Or uh, the diagrams or geometric structures are kind of a set of actions in a way. And so his work is engaged with in a specific way there. Then um, his work or his way of understanding diagrams sort of as an instructive tool, so not just in educational classrooms, but in science, how diagrams function in science 
is also uh, addressed here and there. But again, this is just kind of selective take on his work. It's not addressing him so much as a philosopher, but as somebody who's interested in, in diagrams and gestures as like a particular aspect of scientific or mathematical practice. So he's kind of picked up for a bit and then sort of set aside. Okay, and then again, uh, in recent years, uh, people who have discussed diagrammatics as a particular way of thinking have also uh, engaged with Chatelet. So there's some small parts in Malarkey's book where Chatelet is addressed specifically towards the end of the book. And then Roku Gangel's book also addresses um, Chatelet and talks about how the diagram, you know, has a particular philosophical function, right? That the, the diagram produces thoughts in a certain sense. Um, but there's many kind of fine-grained tensions. Again, this is where Chatelet is seen as a kind of appendix to Deleuze, um, when in fact uh, Chatelet is wary of describing diagrams as representations in a relatively straightforward sense. And there's a kind of closure or a way in, in which they're related to eminence um, as expressed by Deleuze that Chatelet is also skeptical of. So he thinks diagrams are sort of more alive than some of the, di than some of the diagrammatic theorists want to emphasize. So he thinks, um, you know, it's not a sort of closed system of diagrammatic thinking. Diagrams are sort of part of a particular type of thinking, but they have to move on and come from something else. So, um, I mean, that will make sense hopefully more when we talk about gestures uh, later. And then the other place, which I've already mentioned a, a bit, that Chatelet does show up, uh, as I said, is, is a sort of commentator on Schelling, uh, on Hegel to a lesser extent, and to German Romanticism. So there's quite a bit of uh, analysis of him in Hoyse Kessler's work on the left there. And again, as I already mentioned, in Philosophies of Nature after Schelling, Chatelet is you know, somebody who really took seriously Schelling's understanding of the dialectic is something different from Hegel's, right? That this romantic dialectic, as uh, is often referred to, is this kind of, you know, movement back and forth between the sort of intuitive and the formal or the sort of felt and the expressed, uh, and that this is a sort of productive engine for thought. So the idea is that um, the production or experiments of thinking uh, sort of leave a kind of trail that one can capture and then redeploy in these kind of geometrical um, ways. And so, um, and as we'll talk about, especially more next week, uh, Chatelet sees in Schelling um, a sort of understanding of of that there's no maximal difference between thought and nature, right? That we sort of have to present um, the sort of movements and actions of nature emerge as you try to diagram it, right? Or the gestures are nature sort of operating in us that are then expressed and tracked and um, marked in a way, but not sort of closed ever. They sort of can be unfolded and refolded again. So Chatelet is very sympathetic to reading the dialectic as this kind of polarized aspect of the world. But the polarity is not a dualism, right? The polarity, when properly understood, leads you to a sort of third place. And it causes an altogether different force to emerge once it's properly grasped. And that is a big theme of the text uh, from next week, um, which will talk about how the diagramming of polarization kind of breaks itself in a particular way when you look at the history of the sciences. Okay, so then um, to sort of talk more about Chatelet's movements uh, around the world, he sort of initially studied topology, especially differential topology, so looking at like the sort of deformations of shapes and was interested in knots and knot theory for his whole life. He then sort of left France after studying um, and then uh, taught in Brazil. 
This is the obligatory best photo of Châtelet here during Carnival <clears throat> while teaching mathematics in Brazil. And then he, after that, moved around a bit and spent some time in California. And while in California, he met Burroughs and hung out with the Beats and was inspired uh, politically as well as artistically and methodologically, as we'll also see. And he sort of went back to Paris and became pretty rapidly an active member of the Homosexual Front and was part of various groups and queer activist and queer political groups pushing for, you know, sort of pushing the limits of, you know, acceptability and normativity in terms of publishing texts like the one here um, on the right uh, and became a very active part of his life. And as was suggested, somewhat in the Badiou quote, this melancholy and Badiou elsewhere wrote a similar text in his pantheon of, of post-war French philosophers where he talks about, you know, <clears throat> Châtelet's struggle with illness. And Châtelet uh, was, you know, among many others who were really devastated by the AIDS epidemic. And it became a huge part of his life and his thinking, especially when thinking about politics uh, into the 90s, which we'll talk about uh, in the third week and extensively. Okay, so... The other thing he picked up, as I sort of hinted at while in California and with Burroughs, is the cut-up technique. And this is also why I mentioned that he is one of the reasons why he's difficult to translate. You can probably get a sense here where he has these kind of typewriter pages with notes on top, and then he would cut them and paste them and move them around, right? Doing this cut-up method, and of course doing this with theoretical texts, right? So making the argument even more hard to find. And this is a photo um, courtesy of Urbanomic publishing from the sort of archive in Paris, where there's just boxes and boxes of, of texts written this way. And I think one of the things that's worth noting, you know, to write in the cut-up method to produce philosophical texts in this way also shows how Châtelet actually um, makes, in a way, the sign of the kind of written word or the sentence, he sort of diagrammatizes writing itself, right? So by cutting up the chunks of words and treating them like objects more than sentences, right? He sort of applies this kind of diagram diagrammatic method to the construction of his own texts. And this has interesting effects. Um, you know, he, he very much thought that one should write in such a way that it constantly disrupts and kind of disturbs the reader, that the reader has to really focus and hold on. Um, as you know, if you've read the, some of the texts, or you'll see, if not, right, he sort of has this kind of attempt to sort of constantly keep the reader trying to hold on to what's happening. And of course, this method obviously encourages that and helps that or makes that possible. So then later in his uh, in his career, he sort of writes more and more philosophical texts. As I mentioned, this is when he, he attends some of the lectures of Deleuze, and he writes, these are his two, um, his six or two most philosophical books, uh, the Les Anjou de Mobile, which is translated as Figuring Space. That's the one that was the, the text for today was from. And this is his sort of main philosophical text. It's even hard to uh, categorize it. It's often categorized, at least in English, as a sort of philosophy of science, and history of science text. But as you might notice, it's the sort of philosophical range and the stakes of the philosophy goes much beyond uh, philosophy of science. And again, I think that's evident from this quote by Bedou that I read. Right, that he's not interested in epistemology in or in the history of science as this kind of dead archive. And right? he has a very different relationship to the history of the sciences and the history of philosophy. 
And then here, this book, um, which, as I said, is being translated, this enchantment of the virtual, which is more a collection of shorter pieces, which kind of range um, from mathematics to interviews to um, some more critical texts. And we'll look at um, a few texts from that in the last session of the class. Okay, and then um, what he's more well known for, at least in France, and possibly now in general, is this To Live and Think Like Pigs book, which again was mentioned by Badiou, which has been translated into many languages, I think six or seven at least. Uh, this is the, yeah, Italian one, I think. And then he wrote a kind of follow-up to this, uh, this is this um, Sick Animals of Consensus book, which is a kind of collection of his short political uh, writings and sort of newspaper articles and this kind of thing, which as far as I know is very difficult to find and has not been translated um, at all as far as I know. But it's um, it's interesting how these texts, even though they're sort of seen as or discussed as political texts, there's obviously a continuity, right? Like dividing Chatelet's work into these modes is only a kind of short-sighted kind of functional statement. They're not like radically different in terms of the types of things they talk about. Just the way they're written is slightly different and the emphasis is different, but there's a real continuity in terms of the concepts and concerns. So even though um, you know, there's not a direct, there seem to be no direct discussion of science, for instance, in To Live and Think Like Pigs, as we'll see, he often, you know, will critique polit politics or, or political parties or groups that will try to use scientific concepts, for instance, to enliven their own work. So to romanticize entropy or to romanticize chaos you know, in like this kind of neoliberal mode is something that he will attack mercilessly, uh, just without um, any break. Uh, and so he's very much against this idea of the average or of sort of neutralizing politics through a kind of lazy appeal to certain types of sciences. And this is also why in his later years, he dabbled in economics because he sort of needed to fight against it. Um, but will or and in, in how it's used by a certain type of political class, especially in uh, you know post-war France, but it applies globally, right? As neoliberalism spread, the kinds of things he said became more and more prescient, right? They became more and more uh, applicable across the planet into the 90s and, and beyond. So I think he's also somebody who's worth looking at um, for that reason. Okay, so that's the sort of short biography part. Um, now, to sort of, as was again mentioned in the brief of the class, the, the description, it's because it is so difficult because Chardelet is so wide ranging, um, one of the ways, one of the only ways of trying to sort of find one of the through lines or ways of uh, making sense of what he's doing across all these different modes, across all these different disciplines, is his uh, concerns you know, for types of thinking, I think is the best way to say. So he's interested in co how concepts are created and formalized and how formalization is this very stepwise, slow kind of construction of, of thought. He's interested in a kind of um, the very specific techniques of how someone comes to explain an idea, an idea to themselves even, but um, and how that is similar or not in different fields. But one of the, the constants is these four ways of thinking. So I wouldn't call them concepts because they're, they're sort of ways of dealing with concepts. This notion of intuition, gesture, diagram, and sign. And so he doesn't put it explicitly in full, but in several points in figuring space um, and in the chapter of the virtual, he kind of talks about a progression between these four things. And it's not a, you know, it's not a unidirectional progression, 
it's not like a better mantra that things get better, but like when a thought uh, sort of is viewed or captured in some way, it can often proceed to this kind of series of steps. It can also go back the other way, as I'll illustrate. Um, and so uh, to sort of start, this emphasis on intuition, um, which again, in part is why Charles Aluni, who is the keeper of the Châtelet archive, and an old friend of his sort of referred to him famously as the last romantic. And I think part of the reason why, and also why Châtelet is interested in romantic thought, especially German romantic thought, so Goethe and also Schelling, is this, this notion of productive intuition or intuition as a kind of experimental mode, right? So it's not the intuition, it's not the intellectual intuition that Kant and others kind of said was impossible. It's not this intuition of a kind of godlike immediate knowledge of something. Rather, intuition is about the kinds of tacit knowledge one has uh, of, because of being embedded in a practice for so long, right? So it's, in a sense, it's the sort of things you've learned that you don't know you've learned or you couldn't maybe explicitly describe them or you wouldn't need to in order to do something, right? So the kind of experimenter, the kind of um, mode of creating something, of messing around in a laboratory or in a um, studio, right? Um, that there's a kind of, there's a lack of explicit knowledge which allows the first couple moments of creation to happen. That, which doesn't mean it's miraculous or that it's unexplainable, but rather it's an it's again it's this embodied kind of um, momentum, right? It's this kind of momentum of thought, and that's the way he kind of talks about intuition. Though he doesn't really discuss it in explicit terms as which character in the history of philosophy he's taking it from, he just kind of takes it to be the case. Um, and so this is one point at which you could. Be critical of him, I think, and some people have. Um, but for him, it's just like not a particularly interesting question. He thinks it's just, you know, being in a situation and thinking about materials, there's going to be unexpected things happening. Um, so then from this, right, he talks about the gesture. And uh, towards for the, the last part of this uh, lecture today, I'll talk about gestures mostly. Right. And then we'll talk more about diagrams next week and then signs the week after. Uh, so gesture is the one, I mean, gestures and diagrams are the two that he spends the most time on. And the gesture is, uh, you know, um, I'll talk about the sort of history of gestures uh, in, in a few minutes. But for him, gesture comes in part from a sort of French, uh, French, rationalist tradition or this particular this tradition of the philosophy of the concept which we'll talk about some more later that gesture is again it's like thought sort of creating or theorizing abstract things and that as you do that you sort of there's a movement to it right there's a kind of movement or there's an attempt to externalize thinking and that's the sort of beginning of a gesture and so he sort of talks about gestures as things that kind of are um enough it's enough of an ex, of a exteriorization of a thought that, to then have another thought so it's not like a you know solidified thing it's just a kind of platform it's like well maybe it's like this and if that's the case then this is the case and if that's the case so it has this kind of scaffolding it's this kind of scaffolding of thinking in which thinking enters the world in the sense of it being you know not just in the head as he puts it at one point and that becomes a bit more clear uh, when he talks about diagrams. And I put this longer quote here because it's a bit trickier to explain. And this um, this we'll talk about at length next time when we look at the chapter on electromagnetism. So uh, just to say what he says here, Faraday, Michael Faraday, the physicist, uh, takes an inspired position. The diagrams of interlaced axis and loop possess a peculiar autonomy and an elusive power that must be respected and not treated like an exercise in which a mathematical form is applied to physical phenomena. Faraday's experiments are not enslaved to predictions, 
but instead strive to establish a new overhanging point in physics by defining a ritual of gestures, which is always carefully accompanied by diagrams. Their aim is to produce a protocol for approach that is sufficiently bold and sufficiently articulated to release all those possible reverberations of the interlace. And it's pictured here, right, um, Faraday's experiments in the sense of, you know, you have these um, polarities, right? You have different types of magnets and iron filings around them. And how do you explain the movements of the iron filings, given what you know about, you know? So when you bring together two polarized things, what happens, you know? And you start to get, not, you get a diagram of electromagnetic, of magnetic fields, but these diagrams are the, actually the fields that work themselves, right? So nature in the self is, sense is diagramming itself in iron filings. And so this is part of the point that he's trying to make is there's not, it's not like a straightforward application of like a, of a form onto a phenomena. The phenomena is the form in this case. And so the diagram is, is a way of trying to formalize that, but that doesn't close it off to further experimentation. And again, we'll talk more about that, uh, more about diagrams um, next time. But one of the one of the quotes by Châtelet that's quoted maybe the most is he talks about diagrams are a gesture captured mid-flight. So you kind of like imagine someone making a gesture or a movement, and then the diagram is the kind of you know snapshot of it that quickly fades away. And then lastly, you know of this. You know, this progression is then you have the sign. And this is the one that actually Chatelet talks about the least. Um, because I think for him, it's kind of more straightforward. He says that, you know, the, the sign is when the diagram has been crystallized and frozen. Right? So once you have a formalism, right, you've kind of killed to some extent, or you've closed the openness of the diagram to an extent. And of course, this differs with different types of formalism. And this is why, as we'll see, he spends so much time talking about metaphor, because he thinks a good metaphor, for instance, in science or philosophy, also tries to keep itself open, right? So a dead metaphor or a boring, boring turn of phrase um, just kind of thinks, well, I've explained something that's enough, right? It doesn't kind of keep the momentum of the gestures and diagrams that went into it alive or moving in any sense. Or, you know, this example here, this is from a text of Schelling's, but, um, and will this also come up next week? It's why certain formalisms are more interesting for Châtelet than others. So exponents, right? So like pictured here, like some, you know, a number or a letter to a power, like one squared or whatever, or three squared. He thinks that is one of these formalisms in terms of a sign that is more diagrammatic because you have to kind of unfold it in your head. And so for him, certain types of mathematics uh, indicate the, the labor of their construction more than others. And he even refers to this in the last text that he wrote before he committed suicide it was on his desk. Um, he... Uh, refers to this as the revenge of the hand. So algebraic exponents, for instance, you know, remind you of the unfolding of the calculation. It doesn't just, it's not just a number that sort of is a straightforward quantity and nothing more. Okay, so then, uh, as I said, this process can also be reversed. And one of the people who has addressed this the most that I know of is um, Mazzola who people might know. Um, and so, you know, you can thinking about the reverse, right? So instead of intuition, gesture, diagram, sign, you can think about sign, diagram, gesture, intuition. And one of the obvious, or maybe not obvious, but one of the more straightforward examples of this would be music, right? So you see a note, you just know the note is in what key or, you know, how fast you're supposed to play it or whatever, you play it, right? That's the gesture, right? And then you have the sound, and then you can sort of enter this intuitive space of experimenting with your materials, right? Once you hear the sound, 
or the, the beat or whatever, right? You can build from that, right? So it's, again, this kind of polarization, this movement back and forth that is formalized, but differently at different steps along the way. Okay. So, <clears throat> so one of the, uh, I think, one of the difficult aspects of Shetley's thinking and what he takes, I think, most explicitly from Schelling is a kind of uh, extreme externalism. So this, in one sense, being that thought doesn't happen mostly or only inside the head. That thinking happens in gesturing, in trying to act things out. Right, thought is kind of produced in a different way. And if people looked, uh, or if you, or later you look at this introduction to figuring space, he sort of um, talks about the fact that philosophy has become Cinderella. It's become this kind of unfortunate person who is just left, kind of taking care of science or other other fields. And so he writes, uh, sad destiny for philosophy, the discipline that formerly sat at the head of the table, finds itself reduced to the role of a Cinderella taken up with verification and its thrilling problems of directing the circulation of commonsensical ideas. Right, so he's obviously playing with this idea, like from Kant, right, the sort of handmaiden of the sciences or these kinds of images of philosophy. Um, and he's trying to sort of rescue Cinderella uh, or rescue philosophy from being this kind of assistant um, and saying like, no, philosophy can sort of take back its place. And, but how it does that is not by simply, you know, taking care of making common sense arguments or by verifying, right? Um, but it has to kind of go back to its experimental kind of speculative roots. And so again, just to kind of connect this to uh, what I've mentioned with the gesture and the diagram. So again, this is at the end. So that's the kind of sad beginning as he has this kind of worry about philosophy being trapped in uh, role like Cinderella. And then at the end of the introduction, he says, gestures and diagrams illustrate the urgency of an authentic way of conceiving information, which would not be committed solely to communication but would aim at a rational grasp of illusion and the learning of learning. The latter, of course, would be far removed from the neuronal barbarism, which exhausts itself in hunting down the recipient of the thought and in confusing learning with a pillaging of informational booty. Schelling perhaps saw more clearly. He knew that thought was not always encapsulated within the brain, that it could be everywhere, outside, in the morning dew. So it's quite a quote. It's quite a way to end an introduction. He also doesn't cite which Schelling he's talking about, but I, you know, I sort of instantly knew which one he meant. Um, but what's one of the things sort of important uh, to mention here is, you know, he's of course deriding a certain reading of scientism, and so that even though Chatelet is is seen as as Bedu suggested, right, a sort of epistemologist or historian of science, and therefore somebody too interested in this kind of empirical proofs, he's of course saying here, he's not interested in science just being like a fact-finding mission. Chatelet is interested in what's, how science changes thinking itself, right? So it's not just, uh, okay, we've measured this thing where we know more information about this species. It's more like we've when we learn and science is really about the learning, uh, the learning of learning. It's about understanding how thought itself can change in particular ways. And, and also he then kind of doubles down on this externalism, right? This idea that thought is everywhere, right? It's not just in the head. <clears throat> and, you know, and, but again, like, so he's not, but he's also not against obviously the sciences or the, the conceptual power of the sciences, but he's trying to say, you know, philosophy has to, sort of help understand uh, the sciences in the sense of what they're really saying about thinking, not only 
you know, how they can be used for profit or how they can be used to sort of, you know, do something, uh, you know, kind of banal. But like, what's the real radical move that's happening there? And so I said, you know, he doesn't cite the text, but the text that he's referencing, which again struck me as very weird, is this text by Schelling called Clara. And Clara is a really odd text, even by Schelling standards. I always joke it's from his goth period that Schelling sort of wrote the freedom essay and a lot of these uh, texts that are quite dark and, and have a lot to do with the afterlife and the destruction of the cosmos and things like this. And so in this period, he writes, we think, we don't know for sure the date. Uh, in 1810, this text, Clara, which is actually a philosophical novel. And there's three characters. There's a priest, a doctor, and Clara. And the priest is supposed to represent religion, and, and the doctor is represent science, and then Clara is the kind of philosopher in between. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, Shetley doesn't say this, but his introduction, he's, he states as a kind of vaudeville play of between three characters, and then he closes the introduction with this reference to this obscure text by Schelling. Again, as I said, I have no idea how he found this text. Um, it's really not discussed, especially at the time he wrote about it, right? Not commented on at all. But he's sort of using this to kind of frame in explicit and implicit ways his whole kind of introduction, which I find interesting. And... Um, so the quote that he's referencing is that, you know, the, the book Clara is these three people walking around uh, in the late fall uh, and talking about the afterlife and things like this. At one point, Clara says, doesn't she, and she is nature, doesn't nature mourn with us? We are able to complain, but she suffers in silence and can talk to us only through signs and gestures. What a quiet sorrow lies in so many flowers, the morning dew and in the evening's fading colors. In only few of her appearances does nature emerge as terrible and then always only temporarily. Right. And they refer to this particular flower um, that Shine saw a lot in his youth um, pictured there. And so again, there's this kind of, um, it's this, particular form of externalism which could be written off by some people as a kind of naive romanticism as if like oh does the, the flower you know um the flower must feel the same thing as me and you can read that as a kind of naive anthropomorphization but in a sense it's like this push towards a what, what are the real results of a kind of you know um a real continuity between nature um, you know, between nature and um, and thought, right? What does it mean to say that these are these are polarized? They're not separated, and that's this kind of romantic gesture um, that Chutley is into. So, okay, so now I repeat this quote. So the one I already read, right? Um, I won't read it again, but again, right? This kind of emphasizing this point about this neuronal barbarism. And what's interesting is that Chatelet has been read by some of his contemporaries, and at least in the French context, as therefore being anti-science, as not being um, scientific at all. And so this is a very long quote. I don't think I'll read the whole thing. Um, but if, yeah, if you're interested in neurophenomenology, it's a great book. Um, so he, um, Berthoz in this book actually quotes the Chatelet quote I just mentioned and then kind of says we have to kind of battle this, um, we have to sort of battle this uh, attitude. So I'll just read the bottom where he says, um, there's the second half, the most essential properties of human thought and sensibility are dynamic processes ever changing, ever adapting relationships among the brain, body, and the environment. Pontecore ut in mene, said Heraclitus. Everything flows and nothing stays. 
though thought and sensibility are nothing other than states of cerebral activity induced by certain relationships among the physical world, the body, the hormonal and neuronal brain, and its memory of thousands of years of culture. The anger and incredulity that this idea invokes are often rooted in our oversimple version of what the brain actually is. Like da Vinci, what we once thought it was composed of cavities, then like Descartes, it was full of spirits. Today, it is known to be populated with little creatures called neurons, but some are not convinced that these neurons are really the basis, the basic of the subtle capacities that produce music and mathematics. At the dawn of the century, when the heart turned out to be just a pump, poets, sorry, um, people had to make, poets kept singing about love nonetheless, right? So he's kind of pushing back against someone like Chatelet, claiming, you know, um, this this remark about neuron barbarism, you're actually, you know, doing injustice to thinking in the body, even though Chatelet is someone very much invested in the body as a site for thinking. And so with, you know, it's not so much, they're both arguing for a continuity, but the, the question is like, what's the point at which that continuity can be grasped? You know, is it, is there a sort of mechanical or at least we could say even dynamic description, which would, you know, lay waste to the kind of polarization that Chatelet talks about? Um, or is Chatelet saying that, you know, this intuitive moment, the idea of being embodied in a place, in a source of thought, uh, is always going to undermine any attempt to sort of point to the source of thinking as coming from a particular insight, right? And so things get very complicated. Okay, so um, hopefully that's not too much. Um, then just to talk about gesture, right, in this progression, you know, from intuition, gesture, diagram, sign, um, sort of talk about gestures, because they have a particular history, and it's very hard at times to know what Chatelet means uh, by gesture. And there's a sort of, yeah, history to thinking gestures that is not well known, I, I would say. Um, but so again, towards the, the end of the introduction to figuring space, uh, Chatelet says, and again, this is kind of related to what was just said, in its ordinary function, science seems to limit itself to the gestures that guarantee the preservation of knowledge and leave undisturbed the patrimony of those that set it alight and multiply it. Those are the ones that save it from indefinite accumulation and stratification, from the childishness of established positivities, from the comfort of the transits of the operational, and finally from the temptation of allowing itself to be buckled up in a grammar. Right. so again, he's saying, you know, uh, science, you know, viewing science as a kind of reductive program is not what he thinks science is really doing, right? But of course, this can be read as him being anti-scientific in a certain register. And so that becomes a real active question. But this idea of what the gesture is, you know, part of the, the issue, you know, for someone like Berthos who sees Chatelet as being anti-biological, is that Chatelet talks about the gesture as a type of movement, which is as mental as it is embodied, right? There's not a separation there. And you can kind of see this in the sort of history of gestures as things that philosophy has addressed. So uh, and then just the sort of one of the earliest studies of gestures was this attempt to make a universal language out of them by John Bowler, like so. And this sort of unintentionally grounded the beginnings of things like sign language, right? Because there was a sense that um, you know, you didn't need a translator, right? If you had an agreed upon lexicon of, of signs, of hand signs, right? So gestures made into signs, then, you know, you would have universal language. But then this kind of gets complicated quite quickly and you have uh, gestures as being kind of culturally specific and being more related to our artistic expression of cultures becomes a sort of philosophical fascination in the 15 and 1600s. And that continues on until now, of course. And one of the uh, strange uh, aspects of this was that uh, when looking at works discovered from Pompeii, there was a kind of consistency of gestures across time. So they saw people in some of these images making the same gestures as 
and people from the same region were making now. And so people thought, ah, oh, there must be something like deeply embodied and, and almost unchangeable about this. And so this was again seen as why gestures might be important in terms of dramaturgy and, and art history. And then you have a kind of brief and uh, deeply weird attempt to kind of have this almost Kantian notion of gestures in terms of thinking about synthesis. Um, and so gestures are kind of treated as, in a way, similar to what Chardelet says, in the sense that they're kind of scaffolds to reason, but then once you have reason, you don't need them anymore. So they're kind of like a ladder to rational thinking, and then they've kind of, their use is over. And so, of course, Chardelet has a different, a different view of that. But this book uh, pictured here, if anyone wants to read a really kind of quirky take, on using Kant to explain body movements. Uh, it's a yeah interesting book. And then one of the sort of last um, articulations you get is is kind of after this um, gestures in terms of uh, anthropological and biological expressions of emotion. Right, so you get early kind of proto phenomenology or like um, uh, uh, and sort of mixes of psychology and anthropology, kind of seeing gestures as, as emotional, right? As, as basically expressing emotional content. And they even have that in Darwin's work, right? In terms of express, um, expression of emotions in animals, right? Gestures are just seen as kind of illustrative, right? They're, they emphasize things. So again, Chardelet doesn't really address this history, um, but from this history, and this is definitely the silliest slide, I hope. Um, there's three types of gestures. So if you kind of look through this history and you look at how gestures are talked about now, um, they generally take these three forms. So they're expressive, right? So that's pretty easy, right? You can thumbs up or you flip somebody off. Proximic, which are the most complicated ones. And these are the ones that Chardelet is interested in. He doesn't really care about the other ones. So proximic is when you kind of generate a space with your hands, right? So like we like we are the chosen people or something. Like it's kind of an indistinct creation of a space. And then jointly attentive or this kind of indexical, right? Like you over there or hey, you, right? It's a very much has to be about immediate proximity. Whereas right, the sort of abstract ones are, are you know, obviously the ones that shut way wants to explore, he thinks has the most philosophical interest. And I think this is evident from the quote. So the gesture is not substantial. It gains amplitude by determining itself. Its sovereignty is equal to its penetration, and it is why we refer to the gesture's accuracy. The precision of the strike is proof of the reverberation of its skill. The gesture inaugurates a family of gestures, as the rule only enunciates instructions, a protocol for decomposing the action into endlessly repeatable acts. The gesture possesses a historical exemplariness. If one can speak of an accumulation of knowledge over the course of successive generations, one should speak of gestures inaugurating dynasties of problems. Right, so this is quite a, a lot, uh, but this is, some of the ramifications of, of gestures as creating a space. Right? So if you think, um, you know, of course, a lot of times I think in contemporary discourse, gestures have more this kind of dr dramaturgical or like political rhetoric kind of association. So, you know, politicians who have famous gestures associated with them um, might have this kind of expressive function, um, but in this proximate or abstract sense, right, when one kind of creates space with one's hands and then divides it or says, like, you know, we have to do this or, like, what's happening, you know, you can, if you sort of imagine the movement of the hands creating a space, and that space is there when the hands stop moving, and then, you know, from that, you can kind of articulate more dimensions of freedom or, you um, shifts of that space by moving your hands in different ways, right, in different speeds. And there's a sense that, like, if that helps you think, something must be produced in those actions, even if it's almost completely ephemeral. And this sort of becomes part of the question is how ephemeral are they, um, you know, and how, what is happening at the level of the mental in terms of it becoming then embodied? What does it do? 
to the mental in that sense as something that's not properly separate. Okay, so this is the last part. I hope people are surviving. Um, yeah, so because gestures involve this question of embodiment, of course, you have to kind of address phenomenology. And Chatelet has a vexed, I guess, um, not very friendly relationship to phenomenology on a whole as a tradition. He kind of, but he especially dislikes, I would say, phenomenology after Melu Ponty and some of the stuff before, um, but especially after Melu Ponty. Um, and so this is a quote from a peculiar, again, as for strange text. Um, <clears throat> where he's referring to a report written by Eric Allier, people might know. Uh, and so he's kind of ranting about uh, philosophy in relationship to phenomenology. So he says, those who refuse to draw the consequences of the impossibility of phenomenology already announced by Cavallese, which we'll talk about in a second, condemn themselves to stay midstream. Already too far to practice the standard cabotage of objectivity, right, moving things place to place, but still too close to classical phenomenology, and thus caught up in the mad rush of indefinite reductions of the great phantom train of paraphenomenology, and all the picturesque apparatus of vertigo, call, innocence of event, radical otherness, pure vision, the non-presentable presence, the post-front, the post-back, the time of art at the limit of the offering, the pure epiphany of being as such. And finally, sometimes contaminated by what is most odious to the author of these lines, a kind of fascination for the radical evil the black beast always secretly envied. So again, pretty over the top, um, but he's mostly taking aim at people like Jean-Luc Marion or uh, sort of theologically sympathetic phenomenologists in post-war France. And those, uh, a lot of phenomenologists, especially in France, following Heidegger. And so he thinks there's a kind of waiting for the event or kind of obscure, kind of obscuring prose that he really thinks is a problem for philosophy. Um, but of course, he also thinks the opposite is not the solution either, because he's against this kind of common sense, straightforward, you know, sort of happy servant to um, to the common, uh, to the status quo. Right. So he's also he's always trying to sort of find the place for philosophy here. But this reference to Cavallez is quite important. Um, and uh, yeah, some of you, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Cavallez, he's pretty obscure unless you're sort of really into post-war French philosophy. But he's he's the one that Chatelet takes his notion of gesture from. And, and when Cavallez talks about it, he's talking about thought as this kind of propulsive movement, right? So thought isn't about thinking really outside of itself or trying to construct, you know, a system in a certain way. It's about tracing the structures of thought while thinking them. So this is, again, the gesture as a kind of production of a thought that you can then grasp onto and kind of build on it, no matter how ephemeral it is. And this is something for Cavallese is necessary for the kind of history of mathematics. Um, and it also places Châtelet, I mean, we'll see next week how this is not so rosy, in this kind of history of philosophers who saw themselves as, you know, uh, against phenomenology and more in what's called the philosophy of the concept. Right. so this is something that's kind of pushed by people like Canguillem and uh, Foucault, right, um, following Cavier as inspired by him. And that, you know, sort of instead of being about experience in this phenomenological sense and in the ways that, that Châtelet kind of critiques sort of the like inevitable, the sort of um, unspeakable, you know, presence of non-presence or these kinds of things. It's more about like the concept and what it does in the world. So it's about, it's more this kind of constructivist kind of approach. And yeah, Knox Peden's book kind of is one of the more better known histories of this in English. Okay, so then this is the last section. Um, what I think a lot of the, um, you know, what a lot of the kind of work in um, Chardelet is kind of uh, 
based upon and in, in, in Cavallas comes out of is this this kind of in the in con constructing concepts or in thinking in this kind of very small step kind of way in thinking that thought doesn't happen in the head it happens outside the head uh, that there's you know nature and thought are polarized but continuous these kinds of things um, you know the diagram sort of captures the gesture but not totally the sign freezes the diagram but not completely um, that one of the the questions becomes this notion of entailment or this notion of constraint which will come up uh, in the readings in various ways and so entailments right in the sense that like if something is true then it sort of leads to something else being true um, whereas constraints can be kind of constructive or constrictive in the sense of like the body or like the one's form constrains it to be able to do certain types of actions right and so I think the tension there is when you think about something like the gesture. So if the gesture is, you know, thought, experimenting with space, and once in this intuitive sense, right, it seems almost unconstrained. It seems to sort of that thinking, um, doing experiments, right, they entail that something will happen in the world, but those things those thoughts or that way of thinking seem kind of unconstrained. They seem kind of completely free, right? The sort of, um, as we'll see next week, right? The kind of uh, um, thought experiments of someone like Faraday, for instance, or the idea that, you know, one can think and then think about the thought and think about the thought about the thought and so on and so on. It seems that there's entailment there. Like one thing seems to lead to another but it seems completely unconstrained. And so there's a weird tension, I think. Um, and so, you know, I say this because it's also this question of what embodiment really means then. You know, as embodiment or as thinking, you know, the gesture can only occur in a certain way in a body, but it seems to kind of participate in this kind of free act of, of thinking. Um, and to go back to this critique of Berthoz kind of says, you know, Châtelet is anti-science. Um, one of the examples of something like entailment and constraint relationships is we talk about, you know, the form of the body, right? And so in terms of how we perceive space, which again is sort of theme of, important theme of Châtelet, right? So on the one hand, right, our species, right, the, our perception, the way we perceive seems to construct or seems to constrain right, how we think about space in certain ways how right, you think about and this is something that Schelling talks about in the optional text for next week right that we have these excuse me uh, perceptual constraints in terms of you know how our bodies evolved contingently but still kind of constrain um how we how we perceive space how we construct space um, but then those constraints don't seem to entail that space is a certain way. And so this is where Chartley's intuition kind of becomes, um, you know, a kind of anti-phenomenological move in that one is constrained by the body, but that body is very limited uh, and stuck in certain ways. And one can sort of think, always has to think with it, but one can sort of unground or release it from its ne seemingly necessary entailments, right? So uh, this is a you know this idea of you know phenomenology and the Earth, or like you know like all the horrible things that happens to humans when they go to space, like being one idea of you know removing certain constraints. These sort of radical changes in um, in embodiment, for instance, but. You know, when Châtelet makes this argument, though, you know, he doesn't engage with biology, for instance. When he makes his argument, he does it through mathematics. So in this text, which I'll post um, as an optional text, if people are interested, he talks about, you know, non-Euclidean geometry and like what this actually does to how we perceive the world. And this is, again where Châtelet doesn't think this is like a mathematical theory that doesn't matter for philosophy or for thinking, 
he's like, well, you know, when we see space is not something that we're in, right? We're not in predetermined space that we, we generate space as we move through it. Because if, if there's no closed bucket of absolute space, the space is just the result of motion in some regard, then, you know, that means that we can transform the very idea of space itself abstractly. And he says, that's what people like Riemann um, and Cauchy and all these, you know, mathematicians did. And so the whole point is that space is not a kind of vessel or, you know, it's not a sort of empty container, rather that, you know, space is a set of forces and processes which, you know, de which are, you know, space is the deformation, you know, caused by those processes. It's not anything more than this. And he thinks this sort of undermines um, a lot of basic philosophical concepts, for instance. And this is a point in which he and Deleuze disagree, which again, as, as I said, we'll talk about in the last week. Uh, they don't disagree so much explicitly, but it comes out in various interesting ways in other texts. Um, but just to say, right, this is, on the one hand, this is Chatelet's kind of not being happy with certain notions of phenomenology. On the other hand, seeing science and philosophy is not separate, that there's real conceptual work in the sciences. Um, but then, you know, being in this tension of, of what's the source of, of creation um, in the mind, if it's not in the mind, um, but the mind seems to be able to escape its embodiment but only through that embodiment, right? And this becomes this kind of tricky romantic dialectic as uh, Badiou referred to it. Okay, so that was um, a lot of me talking, um, hopefully much less um, in the weeks to come. So then uh, I'll just briefly uh, go over the, this is just from the syllabus, this is nothing new. I won't read through the readings, of course, um, but just to say, you know, what the kind of direction of the course is. I said today we could have talked about these introductory texts, um, which, yeah, you can return to if people are interested. Uh, so then next week, as I mentioned, we'll kind of emphasize, you know, what kind of philosopher of science is Chatelet. And we'll look at this chapter, which is on electromagnetism. I should warn people uh, that it's it gets quite difficult. So if you could, but just read as far as you can. Hopefully you can get to the Faraday stuff. Um, but yeah, it's quite um, yeah, it's quite tricky. And then the optional reading is this again semi obscure Schelling text, which he uses extensively throughout the book, um, which I think actually makes Chudley's essay much clearer so if you if people struggle with the Shetley chapter then i would just read the you know the shelling is dense but in a different way not in a technical way uh, and then so the week after we'll be looking at the live and think like pigs in this uh is sort of raging against statistics uh, and sort of how that's played out politically with neoliberalism and it's also sort of attached, as I mentioned, to this philosophy of science, right? To sort of using things like chaos or an entropy as kind of management words, right? And a kind of hyper biopolitics. Uh, and so he kind of, you know, tries to tear that apart. And then there's several optional texts there, which are sh uh, much shorter and much easier reads. Uh, sort of, yeah, to talk about his life and relationship to politics and also sort of introduction to, to Chatelet by Mo, um, which also talks about to live and think like pigs. Um, and then the sort of last, um, the last session will then be to sort of try and reintegrate these things, right? Which none of like, as I mentioned, none of them are totally separated. Um, but the whole question of how can philosophy be a sort of continuous practice with science and with politics is something that he kind of wrestled with um, more explicitly in this some of the texts from this collection. So uh, yeah, I can share some of the ones that I've translated. And then we'll also talk about his relationship to Deleuze. And again, as I mentioned, this lecture 
um, which is online, um, on or Deleuze is talking about Kant and time, and uh, Chardelet kind of makes some sort of grumpy comments about um, measurement and formalism, and Deleuze kind of disagrees. And then that text that I just mentioned, this little phrase of Riemann, is basically Chatelet's rebuttal to Deleuze. Uh, the argument is very similar. And then um, Chatelet kind of, or sorry, Deleuze and Guattari kind of react, respond to that indirectly in what is philosophy. So there's a kind of discussion happening between them, sort of between the lines, which I think is very interesting um, for how Chatelet is different from Deleuze, but also what are the stakes of, of thinking formalism as something very different? Okay, <clears throat> so yeah. Um, and then just the kind of nuts and bolts type of stuff. Uh, so there are text presentations, which people can sign up for. Um, yeah, I think probably groups of three or four and then 10 to 15 minutes. I will post tomorrow, I will post uh, some more optional texts to some more shorter texts. So you have more things to choose from because we are so many. And I think also because, uh, as I discussed with um, moderators, um, because we're so many, I think we'll have to record them and send them prior to the classes because I don't think we'll have time um, yeah, to do them all because of how many sessions we have versus how many people are. And then the last thing would be, of course, papers, which can be short. Um, and that, you know, I might change, but I think, uh, you know, reading a, reading a text through in relationship to Shutley's concepts, I think would probably be the most fruitful. Um, so I guess you could use the text presentations to sort of familiarize yourself collectively with uh, either the main texts or some of the optional ones. And then I think, you know, building off that, and try to sort of apply something, you know, whether it's a sort of notion of gesture or the diagram, and sort of maybe uh, try to mess with the history of philosophy or mess with some other text um, using Chatelet, uh, if that makes sense to people. Okay, <clears throat> so introductions. Um, I can finally stop talking uh, also. So if people, um, Yes, can just introduce your name and background can mean either where you went to school or what you do as a you know profession or for fun or whatever, a practice. And then, yeah, why are you in the class? Um, or theoretically, why are you in the class? That would be very helpful for me. Um, I guess I should also say it might be worth people just saying very briefly uh, if they have background in philosophy or not, because that will definitely change what things I spend time on in terms of background. Yeah, so if somebody wants to volunteer to go first. Or if we want, or if people want to do questions before. Or there's certain like issues people want to raise before we do that. That's also possible. We can do it either way. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, can you expand a little bit more on relation of category theory? or rather with regard to category theory of um, the diagrammatic uh, part of uh, category theory and the formalism, uh, which is, it seems like quite uh, direct in general, genius, but some quite direct child of a formalism that is critiqued by Cavalier and um, Chatelet as well, and also uses this idea of diagrammatic writing and and in the end comes to a project of logicism, uh, comes to the project of um, um, showing how we can build up this uh, on the hierarchies of logic too. Anyway, um, um, but 
today, as I, I was reading the introduction, um, um, uh, and, and um, one of your one of that you actually um, also introduced in your introduction was also about the category uh, category theory and uh, the evenness of diagrammatics. So I'm interested in if you have uh, something more to say about that. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's the. Of course, it gets very kind of into the weeds in terms of the sort of history of, of mathematics and how that um, plays out. I think part of the, or I think one of the real sort of sticking points for Châtelet, and I think it's also for Cavaillez, is this idea of, um, I think he's distrustful of this notion of mathematical objects, I think, in a certain way. And so I think it's also, I think for the same reasons why he doesn't like, or he sees a subsumption of um, of the diagram under the sign, I feel like he treats category theory as doing something similar. And that, it, and that the movement or the action of the diagrammatic simply becomes a transit. It just becomes like a movement between like well-defined areas or between objects. And so I think it's kind of, um, in a way, it sort of internalizes the movement of the diagram, which I think is something he wants to reject. I would also say, I think, and this has a, um, this is what he has in common with Cavaillez, and this also pushes against um, the way that Cavaillez is sometimes talked about in the history of philosophy, which other, many people have brought up, and that um, people have this issue with Knox Peden's book that I mentioned, is that, um, you know, Cavaillez is seen as they're like, and the whole notion of the con philosophy of the concept is seen as kind of straightforwardly Spinozistic. And this is also this notion of, of the kind of more closed or imminent reading of the diagram. And so I think uh, for, um, for Châtelet and for Cavaillez, right, there's been people saying like their allegiance or especially for Cavaillez, that his allegiance to Spinoza has been overblown or sort of retroactively inflated. And I think it's also why, um, like there's a review of the translation by, his name is um, Masmeo Simmons, I think, uh, which I can post a link to, saying that, you know, it sort of negates all of Cavaillez's relationships and things that he pulled from German thought, like Hegel, but also Wittgenstein and you know sort of like early analytic people you know that he you know he, he went to Davos and, and did all this stuff and so I think it's similar for Châtelet I think he's you know um, there's a reason why Châtelet is really uh, you know into Schelling he's really in they're both really into a notion of creation or exhibition or the diagrammatic which is which cannot be closed it can only be temporarily frozen, but then it sort of goes back the other way, you know. So I think it's this notion of of tr of transit or of transformation that is trackable in the way that I think category theory suggests, at least that can be exported to philosophy. I think that they both reject this. Um, yeah, and I think for the same reasons why they're not, they're also they don't fit under this philosophy of the concept as a Spinozistic outgrowth either so it kind of yeah makes a complicated picture of the whole history but yeah hopefully that does something that was a fantastic answer um just a um a quick a quick question uh, after that um, so the intellectual intuition and um, the concept of inter intellectual intuition obviously becomes mo much more important than in this science that is uh, that diagram as the brain of as, as you said yeah something that can be uh, must be lost and cannot be form formalized um, completely, if I understood correctly, I don't know. Um, if you think of the diagrammatic writing as, as that membrane that cannot be completely formalized or non-formalized, but the transitory um, status of one to the other, maybe, um, um, that if, just to, kind of, to understand you better, um, then we talk about that. Also, we are talking uh, intellectual intuition in the sense that um, that is something beyond and above um, this, the formalized status of, for example, magic that we already have. 
uh, we, um, and for example, if we say that this is true that mathematics is logic, but uh, um, um, product of logic, um, pure logical principles, and uh, something related to the, for example, uh, human um, human life or a human um, way of life, um, as uh, physics is, as um, chemistry is, and all of them, uh, then we can we can say that the formalism of logic. And then the semantic of non-formalism or the creativity of uh, mathematics that shows itself in the form of a grammatic writing or in the form of the gestures um, have something to do with the form of intellectual intuition for, um, of course, Schelling, uh, which I don't know much, for, much of, uh, but also um, if we can talk about that part of Kantian, um, 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 part of this uh, uh, idea of the critical thought and uh, the possibility of intellectual intuition or the possibility of doing mathematics based on the something like intellectual intuition. Yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think the, yeah, that's, I mean, that seems right to me in the sense that um, it's, and it also points to this problem, which I'm sort of trying to wrestle with, is that it's kind of entailment constraint relationship, right? Because it seems like intuition right, and can entail things, but it's not constrained, but then it sort of constrains itself somehow. And I think it's similar with how, um, you know, Cavallez talks about, uh, or this, and in, in this kind of, some of his kind of fellow travelers and other different ways, like Lautman and these people say that, you know, um, and even Badiou kind of plays with this in a different way. And that there is something totally, on the one hand, totally unconstrained about mathematics, but also mathematics has a history. Right. And this is this kind of weird thing in Cavallez, which I'm, I mean, I'm, I know a lot of this because of who I mentioned, Matt Hare, who I've, I've had endless discussions with us about, um, in the sense that there is a kind of chain or there's a kind of, there is some kind of entailment, but the entailment is like in the head of the mathematicians over time. But there isn't a sort of like necessary history, but it, it is necessary in the sense that because it's seemingly so abstract, the things it discovered it discovers, right? Or yeah, you could say are the closest thing to something like intellectual intuition, because if you accept, you know, space is the result of movements and actions, and you could say like mathematical concepts are the result of the creations of mathematics and nothing else, right? And so those then, so there's a kind of internal entailment, but there seems to be almost no constraint other than you know, the history of mathematics being viewed as, as like series of entailments, but that always, always, always happened in this kind of intuitive space. So it becomes a very strange way of thinking or becomes, I think, um, you know, it becomes this kind of this, this way of thinking that is, that is historical yet seemingly doesn't need history, right? That it seems like it's a history of ignoring history. This kind of mathematical creation. And so I think that's in its most abstract terms in this kind of diagrammatic thinking. Yeah, you sort of get the closest you'd ever get to something like intellectual intuition because you're sort of going to the far ends of the polarity of nature and thought. Right? And so, like that movement, being able to diagram that movement is as close as you would get. Um, Whereas for Schelling, he thinks the closest thing is when the artist is about to begin, you know, creating something basically, because what can be created and what will be created is kind of present to them. So, I mean, that's a bit of a crude way, but <clears throat> I think there's something similar in that, in, in sort of mathematical creation for Chatelet. There was a few hands, I think. I don't know who is first. Um, I talked a lot. Uh, I, I talked a lot. I can introduce myself. I'm Armand, the novel, um, a sort of a novelist. I'm happy to be here. I'm here exactly for this question of intellectual intuition. Would be happy to talk a bit about it more. And 
I'm happy to meet everybody. Yeah, I think there was someone, did someone else have a hand up, I thought, or did I, or did they change their mind? Hi, yes. Hi, it was me. Um, I'm not sure if we're, usually we're not doing introductions because uh, first sessions are public, but um, I, I don't mind either way. Um, should we uh, move forward with introductions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, I think at this point it's okay, hopefully. Cool. Okay, so I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Isaac. Um, my background, at least my bachelor's, was in marine biology. Um, I'm currently based mostly in London, but um, right now I'm in Greece. And I don't really have um, a lot of philosophy knowledge. I just picked this seminar specifically uh, because I was intrigued by um, the interpretation, I guess, um, of Deleuze and the, um, since some of my research revolves around um, indigenous um, uh, rights and um, Chalet spent um, a lot of time in Brazil, um, I was wondering um, if I could understand a few more bits from his perspective. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Does someone else want to go? Hello, I can go. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this weirdly? Uh, uh, my name is Atefe. You can call me Ati. I am a, right now. I'm a PhD student in art history. And I have a background in gender studies and also theater. And right now, because I'm mostly focused on different formalism in contemporary art and conceptual arts, and also I have been focusing on semiotics and biosemiotics and thinking about like different kind of graphic writings. And with Chatelet, I was familiar with his book, uh, Thinking and uh, to How to Live and Think Like Pigs, and then I wanted to get back to him, but I wasn't sure that I can do that on my own. So, uh, but I picked this book up a little while ago, thinking it kind of overlaps with uh, all the things that I'm interested in. But in terms of my knowledge in philosophy, I don't have a formal education, but I've always been reading. So some of the obvious things I may not know, but some others I may know. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Ben. Um, I can go. Um, this is fantastic, by the way, the introduction. Um, I, um, I guess I study philosophy. Um, but I'm a musician as well. Um, and it's kind of the problem, the problematic terrain of this Chatelet stuff is sort of exactly what I'm interested in. So, like, uh, I feel like I always tell people that I'm interested in, like, a philosophy of the creative act. Um, I'm interested in this sort of problem of this sort of gestural act of embodiment of thought in in an act of generation or so you know um so this these the questions that this course is raising really get me going so um i'm excited about it um yeah thanks i can go i can go next uh, my name is Libby. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. I am primarily a painter and visual artist, and I also have a background in the history and philosophy of science, medicine, and the body. Um, and in my painting practice, I've come to this point where I'm really interested in the diagram and the gesture. And so I was really excited to see this course and make what feels like a bit of a superficial aesthetic interest into a more rigorous interest. Um, so I'm also really interested in yeah, the intersection of, of a studio practice with a more uh, theoretical practice that engages with, uh, with mathematics and physics and philosophy. So I'm 
really looking forward to it. Thanks. Hi, hi, uh, okay. May I? Hi. Thank you very much, Ben. It was a br very brilliant, interesting. I'm Stefania. I am a professor of uh, comparative literature, and uh, my interest in uh, Chatelet is, uh, co is concerning morphology. Theory of form. I am been studying formalism in theory of literature and in aesthetics. I I, am, I have a good no no good no, discrete knowledge of philosophy, but I don't know anything of mathematics, <laughs> physics. So it's very difficult to me. But I'm I'm trying to to understand shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. You hear me? So firstly, thank you for this wonderful introduction. My name is uh, Carlo. I am uh, a PhD student uh, uh, at the University of uh, Eastern Piedmont in Vercelli in Italy. And uh, my PhD research concern Gaston Bachelard's aesthetics and epistemology. So I'm here because I, I, I came across the name of Gilles Chatelet because uh, in a recent monography about uh, uh, Bachelard's epistemology, I found uh, his name uh, a lot of referred. Uh, I mean, this is, my, this is the monography that I, of uh, Charles Alluny. Uh, mm -hmm. Spectre Bachelard, uh, Gaston Bachelard, and Le Cosso Rationalist. So uh, I'm here for that because uh, I think that uh, in Bachelard's aesthetics, uh, there are, I mean, uh, I think that uh, we can uh, grasp some links for uh, between Bachelard and uh, Chatelet philosophy. Thank you. Um. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Max. I'm from Ljubljana, Slovenia. My background is in media studies, but I've been interested in philosophy for some time now. Um, otherwise, I'm a writer and an editor, and I'm especially interested in different kinds of formalisms as different kind of perspectives on abstraction. So. I'm really looking forward to know more about um, Chatelet and this course in general. So thank you. Thanks. I can go. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris. I'm uh, My background is in uh, philosophy uh, and my PhD is in philosophy of education. Uh, and I'm currently a research scholar at uh, Teachers College. Um, but I've been recently uh, teaching in art education as well and have a like a private practice in um, somatic education. Um, so I'm kind of interested in the intersection between uh, philosophy, art, uh, gesture, and uh, and kind of thinking about what uh, learning looks like in a studio context. Uh, and I've recently been uh, uh, holding a uh, a reading group around gesture specifically. So as soon as I saw this course, they okay. grabbed my attention. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Uh, who's next? Maybe I can go. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and yeah, first of all, thank you for this wonderful session, Ben. Um, my name is Anna. I'm an artist and curator currently based in Milus. Uh, in France. Um, my background is in journalism and media research. Um, so basically, I don't have any background in philosophy, like <laughs> formal one, but uh, like except for some self-maintained knowledge uh, and some knowledge from the new center as well. Um, yeah, so I took this uh, seminar sessions because I I've been very much interested in Schelling's understanding of aesthetics and uh, also been very interested in your works, uh, Ben. Uh, yeah, I remember how like slime di dynamics and also your writings on Schelling kind of, they were very much <laughs> revealing to me. So 
Yeah, uh, looking forward to uh, to knowing more. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I can go. Um, my name is Olivia. Um, I'm based in Paris. Uh, I have a arts background, um, a bit of a background in continental philosophy, but I am still learning so much about philosophy. So a lot of the ideas of uh, Gilles um, are quite new to me um, and definitely no background in mathematics. So um, Bear with me, I, I suppose, on that. Um, but still, uh, the idea of the diagram and kind of how he speaks about it um, being not more important than the metaphor, but more, I forget what he says, um, just how it how it differs and, and how it um, can function. Um, it's quite, quite interesting. So yeah, excited to be here. And um, I'm in the New Center's certificate program in uh, philosophy, or sorry, <laughs> uh, in um, the the uh, curatorial practice program. And um, yeah, so anyway, thanks. Thank you. Um, I guess I can go next. Um... I'm Gio Lingo. Um, I'm a filmmaker from the Philippines. So obviously my background is uh, filmmaking and cinema. And I have no formal education of, uh, in philosophy. I just read uh, philosophy in my free time. And um, I took, a, I took a, a couple of seminars here in the new center too. Um, and, um, my research uh, concerns the uh, con is concerned with uh, the intersection of uh, revolution, film, and terrorism, basically. And um, I took this um this uh, seminar because um, uh, should I lay some ideas of gesture and body and a lot of the images uh, in the film that I'm currently finishing um relates to that. A lot of uh, hand gestures uh, in the body. It's uh, uh, in the body. Um, yeah, basically, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Who's next? I can go. Uh, my name is Arina, and uh, I'm from Moscow, and uh, I have a uh, background in the in religious studies, I have a religious studies uh, bachelor and uh, uh, philosophy um, master. Uh, I'm focused uh, in my research. I'm focusing on um, transgressive experience um, methodologically, and um, I analyze performances of uh, Soviet art group collective actions. Um, I took this class. I don't. I don't know anything about Jill. So I. I don't even. I can't even pronounce his uh, surname. But uh, I'm interested in your works. But I read just um, about uh, horror fiction and Lovecraft, and uh, looking forward to know something about this uh, theme of form. And gesture. Okay, great. Thank you. And to see who's left. Hello, do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm Kamal, and uh, I actually have a background in mathematics and physics. I, uh, I'm also interested in philosophy a lot, um, but my background is really uh, physics mainly, and I'm interested in the relationship between um, physics and um, 
and philosophy in Chatelet's uh, taught. And I'm, I'm actually attracted by this course um, on the title of his book, uh, that because it includes the virtual and the virtual uh, is a you know, topic uh, from also uh, is a concept uh, mainly discussed by Bergson and Deleuze. Uh, so that's why it also attracted my attention uh, like how Chatelet truly incor incorporates this concept in his philosophy. Okay. Is there anyone else? I think we have three people left, Radhi, Parman, and Arina. Maybe they don't want to share. Okay. Sorry. But maybe the, they're not here, so we can move on. Maybe. I will be introduce myself. Yeah, yeah, yes, you did. You appeared twice on the screen, sorry. Okay, well, if, yeah, if other people don't want to, or, or maybe ghosts or whatever, um, that's fine. Uh, are there any other questions um, or things people are curious about? I mean, one thing that sort of, uh, it definitely seems like there's quite a few people, which I guess is not uh, surprising, or have a more kind of arts or interested in arts uh, kind of background. And so, you know, there's certain shifts that can be made in terms of the materials. Uh, like I'll definitely post uh, in the optional materials, there's quite a bit on a metaphor uh, in, in Chutley, which might be interesting. Uh, and also the sort of things I have on diagrams uh, might also be more of interest. Uh, so I guess that'll be kind of the trick, I think, for for next week. In the sense of, as I said, this text, uh, this excerpt from Figuring Space is, is quite difficult. Um, because it's kind of addressing things like field physics and the sort of advent of the concept of a field and the work of people like Faraday. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, we can definitely sort of, uh, there's also a lot of images in the text and he sort of tries to visualize sort of how you can start to think about space as not this kind of like container or is not like a kind of flat, surface but that you kind of have to sort of imagine you know sort of mo moving through the images or this idea of the he kind of calls like the attack of the lateral so this idea of like um how do you understand right the movement of a corkscrew for instance right um and that's something like a corkscrew will kind of you know warp and quite shift a uh, notion of polarity right there's still a polarity at work but it kind of it has suddenly a kind of third dimension in the way it's thought um so you can kind of um if yeah people do have some issues of course people can contact me with that text um but um you know the the optional text by Schelling is also kind of as i said kind of philosophically dense but not technically dense but maybe that's easier for some people um in terms of the way he writes but maybe not uh, hmm. so yeah did anyone were there any other questions that anybody had or concerns about the readings um yeah uh stefina uh, yes please uh, can you um, please repeat uh, our task uh, uh, the two tasks uh, the final text uh, is was uh, uh, clear uh, more clear to understand, but the, the first one, what must we do to, to have a group of three three person? Can you repeat, please? Because it, it wasn't 
Yeah, sorry. It's so it's to have groups of three to four people. And so I guess um, they'll have the sign up. I guess it'll be on the sort of on the Google Doc, I suppose. Yeah, in the drive um, has a link. So then it'll just be a question of sort of, yeah, picking a text and then, yeah, doing a, a sort of video presentation of it uh, to send to me and to the center. Um, and yeah, as I said, I'll upload. Uh, I'll upload some more text tomorrow. So there's more optional text to choose from, especially given some people's interests. I'll upload some more things about, like I said, metaphor and some of these other ones. Um, but yeah, just to sort of give a kind of analysis of the of the of the reading. That makes sense. Thank you. Also, one small thing, uh, will we have access to PowerPoints? Because I was like frantically trying to take notes, but that would just make it easier if we can have access to the PowerPoints later on. Sure, yeah, I can, I mean, I can upload them. That, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, yeah, usually mine tend to be kind of impressionistic in the sense of there's more pictures than words. Um, but yeah, this time I guess there was much more words than I usually do. But yeah, I, I can I can upload them. That's fine. Much. Yeah, especially because of the references, or maybe we can have like a bibliography that have all the references uh, that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Can do that. I have a, a, a general question. I, I was very interested in your sort of brief history of uh, like uh, thoughts on gesture. Uh, and I wondered if if you've like, is this something you've pieced together uh, just from uh, some from digging or are there are there particular sources wh which really kind of cover this as a historic uh, question? Yeah, it was um, it was mostly just a kind of uh, slapped together like digging like kind of digging expedition honestly because I don't I mean there's quite a few texts on gesture but then I think they tend to emphasize one part of it like either this like dramaturgical one or you know the kind of abstract one um, and I know there's been some more text recently like there's a few uh, like there's a whole text just called like on the philosophy of the gesture by an Italian author whose name I'm blanking on at the moment, um, but I could find the reference. Uh, and of course, there's like I think Flusser has a text right on, and you know these kinds of things. But yeah, I was sort of interested in a more almost like uh, like history of the idea, kind of in a kind of almost anthropological um, way. Um, even though yeah, it's sort of at odds with. Um, or it's in some ways it's it's like not exactly what Chatelet is interested in, in some sense. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's sort of why I think doing a history of a concept like that is is interesting because like the history of, you can't it's not really like a history of gestures it's like the history of the idea of gestures basically, <clears throat> which is sort of implied by the content in an interesting way, right? The fact that they are ephemeral, right? They're they're like ephemeral yet recognizable. And so this is kind of, um, yeah, why, yeah, I sort of try to piece together some kind of treatment of them. Um, yeah, but it was really just- Thank you for that. It was very, it was very suggestive. I appreciated it. I'm kind of curious just to ask something about the the romantic dialectic in the sense of like, the Charles Luni quote about Chatelet being the last romantic, or um, mm -hmm. it is this is like a kind of a undercurrent dialectic. Do you see a kind of genealogy of it being carried on, like contemporarily, or like um, I, yeah, because obviously dialectic is such a like overloaded with Hegelian connotation, like um, mm -hmm. and as someone who's who just did a little bit of work on Novalis, and I, I kind of have a familiar, familiarity with the kind of hovering and oscillation that this dialectic entails. I'm just curious if you um, 
see it traced contemporarily in any sort of way. Um, and of course, like Albert Lautman has kind of a different sort of Platonist dialectic. Um, but I'm just curious to like, maybe want to just hear a little bit more about that lineage um, in, in your eyes and, and also if it if it like survives today or if in fact it Chatelet is the last one standing or you know. yeah he I think he might be um, it's I think it's maybe possible I mean it's a bit um I think part of, I mean part of the complication of course is that there's there's various forms of romanticism and even with German you know romanticism it's sort of seen as having a very particular life, you know, in a particular time, and that it's sort of experiments have some lingering effects, like for maybe a generation or two, but then it's often seen as otherwise, you know, I mean, there's a lot of sort of, you know, very typical caricatures of it, which have, you know, as this kind of naive or like self-interested, right? Like seeing yourself in the world. Um, everything is just a mirror right for your sort of poetic uh, existence or whatever like as a kind of you know simplified mean way to put it um i think the complication is when you talk about the history of science an idea of romantic science i think it gets a bit more interesting and i think you can draw lineages there in certain ways um and the, there, are, there are a few defenders of that. I'll, um, we'll, I'll talk about some of them next week. But for instance, there's a book. Uh, I think it's two different books he has. Uh, and this guy, um, Nicholas Jardine. I don't know. Like He's a philosopher of science. I don't think he's super well known. So it's like Jardine, like uh, J-A-R-D-I-N-E. Um, the Scenes of Inquiry is uh, his most famous book. And it's uh, one of the few like proper defenses, I would say, of romantic science in a history of science context. Because of course, you'll get people defending romanticism or German romanticism, you know, in literary theory or in philosophy to an extent, right? Like the concepts are being defended. But in terms of like a practice of doing science, there's like a, a way of creating knowledge that isn't simply just anti-rational or anti-enlightenment, as it's usually kind of thrown away. Um, that book is particularly interesting because he sort of emphasizes the fact that, uh, you know, it wasn't so much as like the romantic scene themselves in nature, but it was also right, seeing nature in themselves, right? And so the oscillation, I mean, I guess the the question about how it's continued or whether you can do something with it. And this is why Chatelet is like one of the few people I think who really sees this well. Is that the, the oscillation isn't like trivial. Like you can't just move, you know, back and forth at will. <laughs> like you can't really like, it's not a dialectic of like, you know, it's not like a kind of purely historical kind of massive battle of... Um, you know, of like forces that kind of, you know, em, you know, emerge in contradictions in these kinds of whatever kind of Hegelian version you want to view of it. But rather, um, and this is, I guess, part of where the Schelling influence comes from, is that the, you know, the polarization of forces is like the nature of nature in Schelling, right? It just, that is the case, right? I mean, this is sort of the argument that Schelling makes in uh, I mean in several texts, but probably most famously in the in his first outline, uh, where he sort of says like, look, uh, which I think Chardelet is very sympathetic to this idea, where Schelling says, uh, why is why is there nothing? Like why isn't there nothing, or why isn't there everything all at once? Like why isn't there pure creation or pure negation? Like why do we have something in between? It's kind of like a weird way to ask like why does existence exist basically and he's you know his his answer is essentially this polarization argument or this dialectic right this sense is like well it's because nature is um you know nature is like battling itself right there's a there's a force of becoming and there's a force of being and they're sort of fighting it out basically and everything everything we see is a result of this um but that's not 
I think like as opposed to Hegel, but maybe this is being unfair to Hegel, um, or maybe as opposed to Marx, there's no like easy narrative to explain it. Right, like then the sort of discovery of, of that tension, um, you know, that that tension has to be discovered in like every particular instance in a certain way. And you know, this was even in this quote, right? This quote from the Clara that Ch that Chatelet references indirectly, right? This, uh, you know, in that discussion, they're saying like, you know, why does nature at one point? Um, there's a very complicated set of metaphors that Schelling plays with, but he, one of the things he says, or, or that they say in this three-way dialogue is, you know, why does nature make things and then kill them? Right? Like, and then there's a very like Median kind of uh, undertone there, which is referenced indirectly uh, because the plant they talk about has like roots that supposedly were the roots that Mattia used to poison her kids. So there's this like layers and layers of metaphor, <clears throat> but it's sort of like, you know, why, why does nature create things and then kill them? Like that doesn't seem to make sense. Right. And, you know, this is where they kind of debate, right. They have this debate about like, well, that's, it's not because nature doesn't have like a pure telos. It doesn't do things for reasons. Right. It's like things are, the result of incomplete destruction or incomplete creation. You can, you can view it either way, right? And this is where the dialectic kind of kicks in, or one way of why it's like a romantic dialectic, because you can view it in that way. It's like, well, nature's kind of trapped, and, or, and so are we. And, you know, and so it's really this idea of um, what's the kind of, I almost want to say pragmatic, maybe that's the bad word, but like what's the experimental mode that follows from that kind of dialectic, right? Like if you say, okay, everything is this kind of like creative destructive tension, you can't just say, okay, well then fine, right? It's like, no, you have to then say, okay, like what does it mean that this, this form, right? Or this, you know, this diagram or this, gesture you know is a part of that too but then it's a question of how do you want to trace the genesis and the ramifications of that thing in that context right because there's no there's no straightforward ground and there's no straightforward end you know telos right and so you know that's in a way why you have to have why well, on the one, one hand it seems naively romantic but on the other hand for Chatelet it's just like necessary to have this kind of uh, creative intuition, this experimental, this creative intuition, right? Because you would to not be overwhelmed by, yeah, by like just seeing nature as like a graveyard of itself. You have to like, you know, sort of like operate within a limited set of of possibilities in order to see that the, those are in fact a limited set of possibilities. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a, maybe that I don't know if that answers your question really, but um, yeah, I'm not sure there's so many people that kind of do that like Chatelet did. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes I worry it's just it's also a result of disciplinarity in a sense. I mean, I think you know Chatelet kind of thinks. Um, and operates like a philosopher from a long time ago, right? Because he, you know, in various points, and we can look at some of the texts, we'll look at the text in the fourth week, like people kind of challenge him saying like, why are you mixing philosophy and, phys and physics and math? Like, why are you doing that? And he says like, well, I'm not mixing them. They're already together. Right? He's like, we, we pretended that they were separate, uh, but they're not. But, you know, of course, they say, like, well, you know, so I think it also, it's very hard for any one person to kind of even have the knowledge to do that. So I think that's in, that's part of the limitation of the romantic mode. Also, you have to be a kind of wildly, um, you know, not like deeply and, and wildly, widely knowledge, you know, knowledgeable in all kinds of different fields. Um, and I think that's increasingly difficult to have. Uh, basically. And I think that's also part of the problem.
I think you could have a romantic collective nowadays. I don't think you could have a romantic thinker as a person anymore. Maybe I'm wrong, but no, I'm skeptical. I mean, <clears throat> another thing I guess I could um, I can say is kind of a general thing about because as I said, uh, you know, Chatelet is really indebted to Schelling in in various in various ways, and you know, people might not be familiar with Schelling, um, but like next week I can we can talk about Schelling more. Uh, but one of the things that I think is is interesting that that. Uh, Chatelet takes from Schelling is a kind of methodological approach to things. Um, and it's also a difference between Schelling and Hegel. Um, and it's also, I think, a difference between Deleuze and Chatelet, but different in a different manifestation. In the sense that, you know, Chatelet is not a systematic philosopher in the way that is usually meant. And Schelling is sort of often ridiculed or historically has been ridiculed as being inconsistent because he could never pick a system. Um, and of course, in both cases, it's kind of misreading their own intent as regards to what philosophy is supposed to do. And in Schelling, it's very clear. You know, Schelling, every mm, five to 10 years, called, you know, had a different system. You know, sort of natur philosophy or you know, the system of identity, or then he had a sort of system of um, uh, kind of ages of the world as a system, or, you know, he had all these different attempts. Um, but when he was, you know, at one point, he wrote in a, in a journal to himself, he said, why would any thinker, why would any philosopher want to have a single system? Because if you had one system, um, you yourself would be simply a component of it. Right? You would make yourself a box and then you put yourself in it. Um, and I remember I, whenever I tell people this, they usually think that Schelling wrote that when he was like a grumpy old man because of being overshadowed by Hegel. Uh, and in fact, he wrote it when he was in his early 20s. So he was very consistent in his supposed inconsistency, right? He... Schelling thought systems aren't things to be, and this is why, again, why I think it's very relevant for Châtelet, systems aren't things to be made and closed, right? Systems are these kind of semi, you know, or pseudo-local articulations of a series of problems, but they're not a closed system. It doesn't make sense. Um, and so I think it's similar for Châtelet, you know, that like physics and philosophy and mathematics are different in terms of the kinds of functions and the way we talk about them. But it doesn't mean that like the matter of their thinking is different. So I think that's very similar. And I think, um, you know, both Châtelet and, and Schelling also did this, not only by being non-systematic in a traditional sense, but also by being methodologically experimental. I mean, it's pretty odd, actually, um, that Schelling wrote, uh, you know, he wrote um, in a way in which his concepts kind of affect the way in which he writes. Right? He's not saying, like, here's my ideas about this. Right? And this is sort of a, a result of if you don't think nature and thinking are radically separated, but kind of a polarization, Every time you talk about having thoughts, you have to kind of feed them back into the world in a way that then changes how you think. And this is also something in Chutley. And we'll see it next week with this um, this universal deduction um, text in Schelling. Where he kind of puts philosophizing about nature like under its own kind of examination. 
right? If you think about philosophizing about nature, it means you have to philosophize about how nature would produce philosophy. Right. So this is kind of the formalism, the weird formalism in Chatelet. Like you it's not a rational mind producing a system by which it could sort of buckle it up, right? As he says, you want to buckle it up in a grammar in this quote of his. Um, but the whole point of gestures and diagrams is to articulate and outline and create like a skeleton of things such that you can kind of put your foot on them. You know, you can kind of build off of them like a scaffold, but you're not, you know, filling them out in any kind of essential way. You know, and it's also why, you know, um, Schelling wrote in terms of outlines, right? Outline of a system, right? <laughs> he wrote like, explicitly in this way and i think it's also why in a different way should later use the cut-up method so much because i think it was also a way of denying himself a kind of rational complacency maybe is the word like by using the cut-up he was kind of fighting himself in closing the system you know by making writing itself diagrammatic and not simply an ordering of signs. There was an ordering of an ordering of signs by way of a diagram, by shifting the words around, you know, chunks of words. You know. So, <clears throat> you know, that's sort of why he's you know, was so inspired by Burroughs because he sort of saw this as, as um, yeah, this text that I'll, up, I'll also upload uh, for next week is an optional one. He calls it this martial art of metaphor. Right, the whole good metaphors make language fight itself. Right, dead metaphors don't. Dead metaphors just you're like, yeah, okay, I get the picture. Right. Whereas you know, realigning language in this diagrammatic way is supposed to really stop you from, you know, right, reading for the sake of seeking information, as he puts it. Right, it's about reading for the sense of remembering what thinking can do. And so, yeah, I mean, that's why, it, that's when I think is the really interesting legacy, to put it in a very long way, <laughs> of, of, of Schelling, you know, Schelling being sort of half a romantic, half an idealist. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of why, why Chatelet, you, you know, relied on him so much. So we have just a few minutes left. Are there any um, last comments or questions? Or anything? I, I just have one small thing, if if I may, just on that last point. If yeah. you say that um, we're talking about the like a supposed rational mind creating a system and everything, what's curious is that um, he's um, purportedly part of like a genealogy of a philosophy of the concept. And so I'm, I'm curious to hear how you square that with the, the sort of, because normally you hear the philosophy of the concept and you think French rationalism and this whole descent from like French Cave as Bachelard and everything. Um, so it, it's like a different, seems like a different kind of philosophy of the concept um, or, or that, that just strikes me as, uh, unusual i'd just be curious to hear you say something about it yeah i think i mean i think it's because um yeah i think it's why again it's part of this i think it's a difference between him and deleuze because i think deleuze is a kind of i think you can make the case that deleuze is a kind of an is the sort of um one of the last expressions of that spirit i would say i mean you can argue this in different ways maybe you could say foucault maybe is more um, but I think, I think the reason why, um, I think it, it, it's very tricky and specific, but I think it's why he's sympathetic to this notion of gesture from Cavallez, um, but he's not, um, but I think why he leans, you know, he's not interested in Spinoza, for instance, you know, Chatelet, he's not interested in, 
he's interested only in the kind of rational experiments which undermine their own authority in the end. So of course it depends what you mean by rationalism in that sense. Because if you mean simply that like the mind, but I think this goes to the tension I was talking about with entailments and, and constraints, like if you mean, you know, in the end, it's like the mind that decides, right? Or the mind is the sort of like real actor above and against, or at least above um, and with uh, the empirical world, right? Rationality kind of exceeds those constraints. I think, um, I think for Shotley, that's like, a, it's like a necessary delusion, but it's not ultimately correct if that makes sense. I think it's like you sort of act as if you can um, think without a body um, in certain moments. I think this is the intuition kind of at play. Um, but he thinks it ultimately not true. And this is the oscillation, right? This is the, the dialectic, you go back, you know, you see why, you know, my hand moved that way when I made this gesture. I can trace it and think about it. Um, but that's only going to get me so far. I have to kind of go back and then kind of re-extend, you know, build off of that in this sense. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing that he takes from Caviez, and I guess this is also, it's complicated how it relates to the other French rationalists, is about the history of thought. Right? And I think one of the things that 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 um, Chatelet really takes from Caviez also is that um, he thinks that the basic structures of human experience or that the basic capacities to think are uh, change with time. Right, And this is like one of Caviez's big kind of pushes against um, phenomenology or pushes against Husserl. Like the idea that like there's some kind of something about human existence, which always allows us to like have experiences in a certain way or whatever. I mean, to put it crudely, um, that, uh, that itself changes. So like the, I, so I think like what the rational is has a history that thinking rights, um, but it's, but that therefore means it's not stable. It's not as stable as a rationalist might want it to be, if that makes sense. So I think that's why Chardelay is kind of in this tradition, but he, but kind of not. You know, he's kind of like, I think he has a very critical view of it. And many people have made the argument that in Cavallez, that Cavallez actually had a much more critical view of it than did the people who later kind of, um, you know, uh, lionized him as the philosopher of the concept, right? So I think like the philosopher of the concept is really Kangiem and to extent like Foucault, but they're saying that Caviez was the first one, but really, it, and again, people have made this case um, other than me. Um, yeah. And I, so I think Chatelet is actually more, yeah, he's, he's more true to the, the kind of version that Caviez meant than what Tanguyem and Foucault said it was later and what Deleuze is, I think, also. But yeah, but that becomes very complicated historically very quickly. How I want to cash that out. Okay, well, so um, with that, should we, I guess, call it a whatever time it is for you? For me, it's a night. For some of you, I guess it's an afternoon. Yeah, we're right on time. Just I'm just posting the links again of the Google Classroom on which the recording will appear by next week and yeah the sheet is available in the drive 
and you can post your name and email so that also everyone can contact each other for to organize themselves as a group and yeah with that i think that's it oh yeah there's also a discord of the new center if it gets easier to organize the link is also in that same schedule on which you can put your names with the texts and yeah you can always send an email or oh, i'll write my email here too and ben's too yeah Yeah, I leave the session open a few minutes so everyone can copy the links. But yeah, else thank you everyone and see you next week. Yeah. Thank you everybody. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good night. Can I close the meeting? For me, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I guess so. All right. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.